Okay. Thank you for your okay, no problem. Right, thank you very much. Um, first of all, can everyone hear me? I will, I'm not planning to use this mic, if everyone can hear me. Yeah? Of course, if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't know what question I was asking you, so <laughs> I'll just guess that you can probably hear me. So, welcome to um, Introduction to Pattern Recognition. This is two lectures and one exercise class in this course. Um, you may have noticed, if you've got a handout, that there are a lot of slides for two lectures, so I'm going to be skipping some of them, um, stuff that you probably don't need to know, or that you've done on some of the other parts of the course. So, straight on with it. There are it, mainly these, these three sections make up this course, and today I'm going to try to get to the end of pattern classification. We might or might not get there today, but I'll, I, I would like to do that because machine learning is a bit more complicated, even though there are not as many slides. So, straight into it. What are patterns? Um, the, the simplest answer is they're regularities um, in the data as opposed to noise. Um, data can be discrete or continuous, n-dimensional support usually, where the support means the independent variable, time or space or uh, what have you. Um, examples are time series, audio waveforms, DNA sequences, uh, images, video, etc. Um, here are some examples from uh, simple DNA sequences um, up to, these are all one-dimensional support functions. Uh, handwriting, here's a signature that you might want to recognize if you're trying to automate banking or something like that. Um, anyone guess whose signature that is? That's Barack Obama's signature. Um, here's a voice print, blood vessels. Um, recently, people have been trying to recognize activities, particularly in an airport, suspicious behavior in an airport, for example, um, and identifying people by the way that they walk. These are recent um, developments. Um, Fingerprint and iris are still probably the two most biggest biometrics for trying to identify people, verify who people are, but face recognition is also um, obviously very important. So, um, what kind of application areas um, is pattern recognition used in? Coding and recognition, retrieval of text, image, and video is, is the main thing. Um, we might want to um, transmit or store images and video um, and that the original volume of data can be too large to do that comfortably so we want to compress it. Um, video archive indexing in order to render it searchable afterwards. Um, duplicate detection for copyright monitoring and so on. Speech recognition, written text recognition, um, medical screening, biometrics, um, which is all about identifying who people are or checking that they are who they claim to be. DNA testing, face, iris, fingerprint, signature and gait. Uh, detection and recognition and verification are slightly different things and I'll talk about those when we get there. And uh, abnormal activity detection. These are just examples. So first, feature extraction. Uh, the first thing to do before you can try to recognize any kind of uh, pattern is to extract some feature from it fe or features um, which hopefully capture what you're trying to recognize. So here's an image, here's a pixel, ij, and here's ij plus k, so it's a few k pixels along the same row. Um, and you might think that the value of these two pixels is probably going to be, might even be the same. Um, here are the same two pixels in a natural scene. The value's probably not going to be exactly the same, but it's probably going to be very similar. It'll be more similar the closer these two pixels are together. Um, so to transmit or store all these pixel values independently is a waste of transmission bandwidth or storage. So, and if you look at an 8K super high vision signal, which is something that NHK is making a lot of noise about right now. 
uncompressed 8K super high vision signal is about 48 gigabits per second. So you don't want to be transmitting or storing that if you can avoid it. So the aim is to reduce the redundancy. For example, in this case, you might transmit the background pixel value and then say, repeat that 30,000 times. So, so the question then is what features should you try and code? Um, I don't know how much image processing people have done, but this is a very basic um, kind of image processing function is convolution, which is, consists of sweeping a filter, which is this two-dimensional mask here, across an input image, usually in kind of raster scan order. So if your image is f of i, j, normally i is the vertical and j is the horizontal coordinate when we're dealing with images. Um, filter mask is H, and this is the convolution. So at every pixel, you get an output that is this sum of products of the input. OK, um, now wh why might you want to do that? Well, here are, here's your input image. Again, these are all the pixels lined up into one big vector um, of n dimensions, where n is width times height of your image. So this is um, a real valued n-dimensional vector, which we'll call x. And we're going to put it through some kind of, initially at first, linear transformation, we'll assume linearity at first. Um, transform transformation matrix is A. And that will extract m features, uh, which is a real vector in this m-dimensional space here. Then we're going to do whatever we want to do with it. We might want to store it on disk, or we might want to transmit the data to somewhere else. And then there's going to be a decoder at the other end. And at the output of this system, we'll get some kind of reconstruction of the input system. Um, so if we represent the data as this vector x, um, which is just produced by stacking all the pixels up into one great big vector. Remove the mean. We tend, tend to usually remove the mean or assume that it's zero. And then extract these m features. What, what they are, we'll worry about in a moment. So here's your transformation. If m equals n, that's, that's to say if the number of extracted features here is the same as the number of pixels going in, so that this matrix is square, then the transformation is usually invertible. You can, in principle, recover the input signal exactly. Um, and you might want to do this in order to treat these channels differently before um, you invert. If, however, there are fewer features than input pixels, which there usually will be, then the transformation, the whole process is not invertible. Um, but it does achieve dimensionality reduction um, or compression. So you're reducing the amount of data by extracting relevant features, you hope. And what is a relevant feature is going to be expressed in our transformation matrix so that we don't waste bits or bytes in transmission and storage. So here's um, uh, another example. It's a face recognition example. Here's the real world with the camera pointing at some bit of it where, where this guy is. And this system is going to extract some features from this input image, which we've yet to determine what, what they will be, and pass them to a classifier here. This, at this point, we have a feature vector. And we're going to, that is going to um, arrive in this so-called feature space here where the axes are the values of our features. And it's going to be represented by this red dot here. Um, and then in order to do recognition, you have to compare your input signal to people's data that's stored in a database. So here we've got a couple of people's data in the database. And if you plot those in the feature space, they, they pan out like this. So in this case, since our input feature vector is pretty close to these green pluses and not so close to the uh, blue X's, we're probably going to conclude that this is more likely to be person B than person A. So the decision from this classifier will be person B. 
So there's an example. And the features that we want to extract are such that this task will be as easy as possible for us. So, uh, well, what, is, what are the best features that you can extract? Um, given that your extraction method is linear, statistically you can show that the best um, thing you can do is a thing called principal components analysis, um, where the feature vectors y extracted by this transformation matrix R, uh, they have a covariance matrix CY, which uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with covariance matrices. Um, what a covariance matrix does is it explains or it encapsulates how the various components or the different features vector Y co-vary with each other throughout the data set. Um, and it turns out that the E here is expected value or an average, statistical average, if you like. So this is Y times its own transpose. This is a so-called outer product here. And this is the expected value of that or the average value of that. Um, and that covariance matrix can be expressed in terms of the covariance matrix of the input here, CX, and the transformation matrix A. And by a good selection of the transformation matrix A, we can give this covariance matrix of our feature vectors certain desirable properties, such as um, uncorrelated. We, want, we would like the components of Y to be uncorrelated with each other so that we don't waste bits transmitting or storing very similar pixel values, for example. So the way to do that is that we set the M columns of this transformation matrix to be the eigenvectors of the correlation matrix of the input signal. Um, if you take the eigenvectors of a correlation matrix, um, they each come with an eigenvalue which expresses how much of the input signal that particular eigenvector expresses. So in eigenvalue order, we line these eigenvectors up in our transformation matrix A. And if we do that, we can show that the covariance matrix Y of our output feature vector is diagonal. So it only has non-zero entries on the leading diagonal, um, which follows for various mathematical reasons. And that means that the components the ith and the jth component, or our ith and jth features, are uncorrelated with each other. And this notation means that um, the expected value of this inner product here is lambda i, which is one of these eigenvalues here, if only in the case where i and j are the same feature. For any, for any different pair of features, these are uncorrelated. And that's a good thing. Um, Effectively, what we're doing in this process is, here's our initial input feature space. We've got two axes here, x1 and x2. Um, that's, and the, the data is these blue crosses. And what the principal com component analysis does is it extracts these two principal components, a1 and a2 here. Um, relative to this is the mean of the input signal there, which we're going to take out. Um, and I think you can see from this example that expressing these points in terms of these axes, y1 and y2, um, is more efficient than x1 and x2 in the sense that they're not correlated. Um, the, the general diagonal layout of this cluster of data here means that there's a certain correlation between the value of x1 and the value of x2. Because for a, if x1 is larger, x2 tends to be larger. And if x1 is smaller, x2 tends to be smaller. But if we take the axes as these axes, then there's no such correlation. Um, and most of the signal energy ends up in this uh, axis here. OK. Um, from that, we can reconstruct the original data vectors from the um, amounts of each of these principal 
components. Um, and the, the, effectively, this means that the reconstruction of the signal there is uh, an orthogonal perpendicular projection of the input onto a, a subspace um, of these principal components. An example of this from nearly 30 years ago now, I guess, was uh, a very early face recognition system called eigenfaces, for obvious reasons. Um, this was, um, th these Kirby and Surovich originated this, but um, Alex Pentland at uh, MIT popularized it back in the early 90s. So given a set of face images which are roughly aligned, so you've got the eyes in the same places and so on. Um, you calculate the mean face, this is the mean face of, of these, the average, and then the first M principal components. And these are eigenvectors of the correlation matrix of this data set. Uh, so this is the first or biggest principal component and you can represent any of these images as a weighted sum of these eigenvectors added to the mean there. So you start with the mean, a certain amount of, adding a certain amount of this image to the mean will, light, will give you a lighter area up here and darker down here, then adding a certain amount of the second one here will give you a, will darken this region here and lighten this region here and so on and so on. And you can see that these eigenvector images gradually get more complex um, as you go on. Okay, so um, there's a problem with this scheme if you just apply it naively and that problem is that the covariance matrix is extremely large so for even small images, 128 by 128, the covariance matrix is 16,000 by 16,000. And you don't want to be computing eigenvectors of that if you can help it. So there's a thing you can do whereby instead of computing the eigenvectors of, of this thing, you can compute the eigenvectors of this product instead. Um, because that's a much smaller matrix and then you can recover the eigenvectors of the larger matrix, quite simply. Um, you don't need to particularly know about this, but it's worth mentioning it in passing. Um, so how do you actually use this system to recognize faces? Well, the first thing you need to do is build a database. So we've got some faces RK, um, which we're going to build our database from. We project each of these face images are K in the, in the previous slide, that's, that's these here. We're going to project each of those onto our um, eigenspace and then that, that will give us a vector YK, fe feature vector YK extracted from each of those um, input faces and that's the series of weights by which you combine these to get that particular face. Okay. So then given an input face which we want to recognize, do the same thing, extract its feature vector, call it Y dash, and then we'll try and recognize R dash, our, our new input face, by finding the nearest, perhaps for example, finding the nearest neighbor of our feature vector among all the feature vectors that we extracted from the, from the, the database vectors. So uh, this is what it looks like in practice. These are often the same set, but they don't have to be. Um, first thing you need to do is build your database, build, build your eigenspace, sorry, uh, from these, this training data here. Um, do the keyhole trick if necessary. Actually, there are computational computationally better ways of doing it, but uh, compute your mean and the, the top M eigens, eigenfaces, eigenvectors. Um, then build your database. So these, these are the RK, these are the people who you want to uh, 
potentially recognize in the input. Project each of those onto this eigenspace and get yourself a feature vector yk for each one. Then with the novel input face here, r dash, again project that onto the eigenspace to get yourself a feature vector y dash and then compare y dash to all these yk that you computed from the database. And for example, find the closest one of these to this one, which will give you your result. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, in general, though, you might ask what are good features for a particular task, and the answer is that they need to be robust, um, which means that they should be similar within each class. I ideally, we would like uh, different images of the same face, maybe up with different lighting or slightly different face pose, um, different facial expression, whatever. We would like those not to be too different when we extract the features from them, uh, invariant to likely input transformations. Uh, we also obviously want them to be dis discriminative, so we, we don't want them all to be the same, we want them to be different for each different person that we want to recognize. So they should be similar within each class and they should be significantly different for different classes, ideally. Um, if your feature space looks like this, then you're in with a chance of doing fairly well because you can, you can uh, divide this feature space up quite easily with a simple boundary. Um, you can occasionally get multimodal situations like this where a given class has more than one mode, but you can still, if the data is in the right places, you can still uh, do the classification reasonably easily. Um, a lot of data is non-linearly separable, so your decision boundary, so-called, might look like this, which is a little more complicated. Uh, alternatively, if you choose your features unwisely, you may end up with a situation like this, where, where you can really do very little to uh, separate the data. So here's a, an example again of those from, from face recognition. Um, Errors in face recognition systems usually arise from differences between uh, the registered data and the conditions under which you try to recognize uh, new people. Um, and ideally, you would like your system to be robust to camera parameter variations, like the focal length of the camera, for example. Lighting variations are particularly nasty. Uh, aging, makeup, facial expressions, speech deformations, um, variations in hairstyle, sunglasses, face masks, etc. 3D head pose. So you would like your system to work even if people turn their heads uh, to some extent. Here's an example of what can go wrong if you um, approach the problem too naively. Here's an input image. Here's two people in the database, one of whom is this person, but if you just compare these images naively, the kind of pixel by pixel comparison, you're probably going to find that this image is the, the more similar to this one than this one. However, you can see that this is in fact the, the correct answer. So this is an example of the kind of variation that you have to try to overcome when you're designing a recognition system. Um, Approaches to this problem include using combinations of positional or so-called shape and luminance texture features. Um, there are things called Gabor features um, named after a guy called Dennis Gabor who's um, uh, a very big originator of uh, communication theory 50 years or so ago. Um, measured at spe specific facial locations and this system is an example of one of those type, uh, which is still now being used in slightly modified form in modern, modern face recognition systems. Um, the idea is that you define a number of so-called fiducial points on the face like this and fit a kind of mesh to them. And then at each of those points, you extract several of these Gabor features. 
um, and then assuming you do the matching properly you can get the the, the grid to track with the face uh, and hopefully overcome the effects of 3D pose variations. So 3D shape features, if you can compute those, are the most invariant to 3D head pose variation, but they are computationally extremely difficult to challenge, much more difficult than just doing pixel by pixel comparison of, of images. Uh, you need stereo cameras or some kind of shape from motion uh, and 3D shape reconstruction. Um, it's still true today, although face recognition is getting better and better and better, it's still true that for biometric verification, which is uh, trying to verify that somebody is who they say they are, like the, at passport control in the airport, for example, uh, iris and fingerprints are still more effective than face recognition right now. But, of course, they're more intrusive. You need people to cooperate with the system, um, whereas face recognition it requires less uh, cooperation. Okay, so um, here's a, a rather simple example of some features. This is from the DHS's Do to Heart and Stalk, which is one of the um, texts for this course. It's kind of old now, but there isn't really much of a, a better one. Uh, so most people, I think, still use this text. Uh, this is an industrial inspection problem. We've got two types of fish on this conveyor belt and a camera pointing at the conveyor belt. The two types of fish are salmon or sea bass, and the idea is what, what kind of features should we try to uh, extract to distinguish the salmon from the sea bass. And there's a lot of unrelated variations, just the lighting of the angle of the fish and also all kinds of things. So you could use the length, if you could extract the length of each fish on this conveyor belt, you could use the length of the fish as a determining feature because salmon, this black histogram here, um, are on average shorter than sea bass. Here's the pink. The pink histogram is the histogram of lengths of, of the sea bass. So if you put a decision boundary at this length, you can minimize the number of errors. So you say any, anything shorter than this length L star here, we're going to call it salmon. Anything longer than that, we're going to call it sea bass. And if you do that, if you position that boundary here, you'll minimize the number of errors you make, but you will still make quite a lot of errors because there's a lot of overlap between these two histograms. Okay, well, how about using the lightness, the color of the, the scales instead? because there's not quite so much overlap between the histograms of scale lightness. Well, if you put the boundary here, you do better than with length, but still not good, because there's still some overlap between these histograms, so you'll still make errors. Um, so how about if you use both of these features? For some reason, the text goes from talking about length to talking about width. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, if you plot one feature up this axis and the other feature up this axis, actually, it starts to look as though you might be able to do a better job than with either of those features alone by, for example, if you use this line as a decision boundary, anything this side you call salmon, anything this side you call sea bass. Um, and you can simply encode this two-dimensional feature by this single coordinate, which is kind of like a principal component, um, and anything that's across that line here you call a sea bass, anything that's down here you call a salmon, which uh, is in in technical terms, it's, that's a thing actually called linear discriminant analysis. Um, and the problem in linear discriminant analysis is to find a single direction, a single linear projection of your data that best separates two classes. This is not actually the same thing as principal components analysis. You're just trying to find one uh, projection. 
Um, and it's an extreme example of compression or dimensionality reduction because you're reducing the whole problem to one dimension, effectively. Um, so here's a two-dimensional feature space with blue and green data sets. If we choose this V as a direction to project our data onto, the projections of the data all get mixed up. That's not going to be very useful. If you choose this projection, however, then all the blue points project around here, all the green points project around here, and if we drew a boundary around here somewhere, we could distinguish quite reliably with just this one projection. So that illustrates how you should do linear discriminant analysis. Uh, geometrically, uh, what you're trying to do is maximize the distance between the means as they're projected onto the uh, projection line relative to the scatter among the classes. Um, LDA only considers second order statistics. We, we, it doesn't go into higher order statistics of probability distributions or anything like that. Uh, and it seeks to maximize this measure. Um, mu1 and mu2 are the, the mean positions of, the, of each class. And S1 and S2 are the scatters or, or variances of the classes. Um, so uh, a bad example is when the means are close to each other relative to the scatter in the classes. And a good example is where a, a projection direction which makes the means relatively far apart relative to the scatter in the classes. Uh, mathematically, if you choose um, a projection direction V, then the distance from the origin to X projected onto that direction is this inner product of V and X. So we can compute the distances to class means like that. Um, the, this is the squared distance between the class mean, the projected class means. Turns out to be this thing here. So this is a, a quadratic product, effectively, um, where this matrix in the middle is the so-called between-class scatter matrix. And that, that expresses how close together the two means are. Um, relative to that, we need to know the, uh, the scatter within each class, which is expressed by this other scatter matrix here. Um, and that expresses the variance of the projected data within each class. You have one of these. C here is the class index. So you have one scatter matrix for each class. Usually with LDA, you just take a, a sum or an average of the scatter matrices. Um, so uh, if we combine these two uh, within class scatter matrices, we get a thing called SW, which is the within class scatter. And our problem then reduces to maximizing this thing called a Rayleigh quotient, which is this quadratic product involving the between class scatter matrix and this quadratic product involving the within class scatter matrix. And we're trying to maximize this thing as we vary V, the projection direction. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but suffice to say, it, it, you end up with an eigenvalue problem that needs to be solved, can sometimes be simplified. And uh, to cut to the conclusion, the solution is any multiple of this thing, um, which relates the, the two class means to the within class scatter matrix. OK. Uh, if you want to normalize that thing so that V is a unit vector, then you just divide it by the uh, length of this thing. And LDA can, works fine for two classes. It can also be generalized to multiple classes as well. So that's probably the simplest classifier out there. Um, 
it addresses the problem that a naively selected pro projection with widely separated class means, even, even though the class means are widely separated, it may not be the best given the way the classes are scattered. So here's an example where you might think, just looking at the class means there, there's the blue class mean and there's the green class mean, you might think, just looking at those, that projection onto this axis where they're widely separated would, would be the naively the best thing to do. In fact, projection onto this axis is going to work better, even though this distance is, sh is smaller than this distance because of the shape of the scatter matrix for, for each class. Um, LDA will fail in s cases where uh, the scatter's not very Gaussian or where the information that distinguishes the classes is, is in the scatter rather than in the class means. For example, these cases here, LDA won't work on these uh, examples and you need to uh, do something else. Okay, um, a little talk about modern image features. Um, classical analysis has tended to use so-called linear shift invariant uh, features, that's the convolution filters that uh, I was talking about earlier. Um, and these, this comes right back from the early days of, of electronics where um, filters were generally linear, made of mechanical, actual physical hardware components. Um, and one-dimensional signals like audio waveforms were assumed to have time invariant statistics. Um, and feature extraction in images has, has been based on that for, for several decades. Um, but recently there, there are some nonlinear features coming forward and nonlinear classification uh, algorithms and so on that can achieve better results and adapt to non-stationary image structure which means the statistics of the image change uh, depending on where you are uh, in the image. Um, well, what does that mean? Why, why does why image structure change statistically with where you are? And the answer is that, that images tend by and large to contain objects which have more or less sharp boundaries. Uh, objects tend to be more or less convex on, on average with, with sharp-ish boundaries. And boundaries are generally oriented edges, so they're locally one-dimensional if you look at a close-up of a, an edge, uh, which means that the statistics are, are different, for example, parallel to the edge and, and perpendicular to the edge. If you put the word images into Google image search, or at least when I did this, these were the top searches. And you can see even from these that these objects are mainly approximately convex and they have boundaries uh, which are more or less edge-like. Um, Semi-classical image features have tended to use texture descriptors like Fourier transforms, which express the kind of spatial frequency content of, of image patches, uh, wavelets, uh, and then the non-stationarity, the, the variations in statistics have been dealt with by edge detectors, um, followed by some kind of non-linearity. Uh, and this kind of goes back to the mid-80s, the edge detectors were, were very uh, popular. Um, here's a, a classic test image. The reason this is probably the most u widely used test image uh, in image processing is because there are smooth regions and there are high frequency textured regions. There are strong edges and uh, there's a bunch of noise up here. Uh, and it, this image has been very widely used for image coding and filtering stuff. Um, and here are some outputs from edge detectors. Here's a gradient. Now, if you take the gradient, that's to say a, a, the local rate of change of the uh, luminance of each pixel, you get something like this. 
Uh, you can then do some thresholding, which is this non-linear uh, operation, and thinning and try, try to end up with an edge image, which you can use to guide directional filtering and so on. Okay. Um, the Gabor wavelet um, is another image feature that's still used quite frequently today uh, in a lot of face recognition software uh, as an early feature to be extracted from faces. What a, these, here's an example, Gabor wavelet, and here's another one with slightly different variances. Um, and what these things are is there's a Gaussian window which multiplies this thing here is a complex exponential, so it's a cosine and a sine function uh, oriented in some particular direction like this. And if you do a convolution with this filter with an image, what you end up doing effectively is measuring how much of this frequency here is in, present in each image patch, how much of energy is present at that frequency. And usually these things are used in multiple orientations and multiple resolutions like this. So here's a filter bank. Um, these filters are the, the real part of the complex exponential. There, there's a, for each of these cosine filters with a peak in the middle there, there's a sine filter as well, which goes through zero at the, in the middle. If you look at the frequency domain, the Fourier transform version of these, this, these spatial filters, you end up with something like this, where the smallest filters in the spatial domain are the biggest filters in the frequency domain and vice versa. Uh, another useful feature uh, of these Gabor features is that um, because they are complex exponentials, because they have a sine and a cosine um, components, they have a phase that you can re recover from the result of the convolution, and you can use that phase to estimate a spatial displacement between the input image patch and, for example, a face in your database. So you can move a feature point, you can estimate, the, for example, the shift between a feature point on a face in the input and a feature point on the face in the database and move them so that you can do the alignment between your input uh, face and your database. Okay, so these are still used rather frequently. Uh, another wavelet type feature that's used quite frequently is the so-called Harlite wavelets. Uh, Viola and Jones is probably the world's most commonly used uh, face detector. Um, this has been around since about 2001. Um, the OpenCV is an open source computer vision library that I guess several people will, will probably be familiar with. Um, and one of the most popular functions in the OpenCV library is the face detection uh, functionality. What this does is uses these Harlike wavelets. Here's a Harlike wavelet. All it is is it's simply the difference between two or more rectangular regions in the image. So um, the the thing that these people, Viola and Jones developed is a so-called cascade style face detector um, and the objective of, of this thing is to reject any region in the image that's obviously not a face as quickly as possible so that you can get on and look at regions that might be faces. So as an example here's a very simple uh, Haar wavelet feature. Normally the region of the eyes here, if you take the average pixel brightness of this rectangle, it'll be less than the average pixel brightness of this rectangle. And that's so usually true that if it's not true, then it's almost certainly not a face. 
So this is a very simple test you can do to establish whether a region like, like this is likely to be uh, a face region. If it is still likely to be a face region, you think, then you can go on and do a, a more complicated feature like this one, where, for example, this region in the middle has an average brightness that's larger than these two regions at the side. And you can keep on going and going with more and more complex features uh, until you conclude either that this region is, that, that you're testing is not a face or it probably is a face. So uh, the difference between this set of features and a lot of other feature sets is that this one is vastly overcomplete, um, which means that there are way more features than you would need to be able to reconstruct the image, but it, this isn't used for image reconstruction. So uh, the classifier will subsequently learn which of these features are useful. So this is a more modern image uh, feature or a more modern approach to detection than some of the earlier ones. Uh, these things, these HAR-like wavelets can be um, computed extremely fast uh, by using a thing called an integral image. Uh, what the integral image is, is it's simply a, um, a sum, the integral image the value of the integral image at any particular pixel is the value of all the pixels in your original image that are northwest of the, the current position. So uh, the values in the integral image increase as you go further bot to down to the bottom and, uh, and further right. Um, this thing can be computed very, very fast. And then if you want to know the average brightness of pixels in a block like this in your original image, you only need to do four array accesses in the integral image and there's your result. So this is a very, very fast way of doing that computation. And that's one of the things that makes this type of face detector very fast. Uh, another image feature that's become quite popular for face recognition and, uh, and other object recognition is local binary patterns these have been around since about 2000 again. Um, and these express local brightness variations in images. So at a given pixel in an image, you look at the brightness at a, at a load of surrounding pixels and look at how that changes relative to the brightness of the pixel at the center. Um, this, in this example here, we might find that these four pixels are lighter than the pixel in the middle, and these four pixels are darker, which may mean that our center pixel there is sitting on, on an edge, a brightness edge or something in the image. Uh, and then the coding of these patterns is, is fairly straightforward. Um, these features are invariant to monotonic transformations of, of the image brightness, such as addition, if you increase the light level of the image, these feature values don't change. Uh, multiplication, okay, if, if you increase the strength of the illumination, which is a, effectively a multiplication, uh, these feature values don't change. So they're quite useful for invariant face recognition. Another one is the histogram of oriented gradients. Um, this has been around for just over 10 years. Uh, it's good for detecting whole bodies, or whole, whole people upright walking in, uh, uh, in pictures. Uh, these features express the distribution of orientations uh, of the image gradient within an image. Uh, these are also invariant to monotonic transformations and a certain amount of dilation and translation and rotation. Um, what they are, uh, this is an example of those Within each of these image cells, we compute a gradient, that's the, the amount of energy um, in the derivative of the image in a particular direction. Uh, and then, so here's the, this is what the, the overall gradient looks like for this image here or the training set. Uh, and then this, these systems tend to use classifiers based on 
so-called support vector machines, which we'll deal with later. But to cut a long story short, if you have a series of activations that look like this, so this is the person's outline, top of the head, shoulders, strong edges on the shoulders, edges down the side of the body, edges aligned with the legs, then this is quite likely to be a, a person. Whereas if you have edges in these situations down the middle or perpendicular to the top of the head, then this is far less likely to be a person. And the statistical classifier will use these inputs and uh, decide whether there's a person. So this is often used for trying to spot pedestrians. You know, Self-driving cars is the um, act, very active research area right now. And these features tend to be used to try and spot pedestrians um, on cameras mounted on self-driving cars. Uh, the last modern image feature that I want to mention briefly is the so-called scale invariant feature transform or SIFT, uh, which has been around since the early 2000s. Um, the idea of these features is that they attempt to extract um, a difference of Gaussian blurs, which is a more, slightly more blurred image minus a slightly less blurred version of the same thing, which is effectively a, a kind of a bandpass filtering, and then find extrema, the maxima or minima, of this uh, signal as you vary the scale and the rotation. Um, and these extrema are called key points. And in theory, once you've found a number of these key points, then these will be invariant to image rotation or image dilation, that's or scale. Um, so to give you an ex uh, example of that, here's an example of some uh, image gradients in a, little blocks in an image. These are four by four pixel blocks in an image, gradient computed in each of those blocks. And uh, this is a SIFT key, key point descriptor extracted from this kind of stuff. If you want, the, I won't go into all the details, but if you want the details, you can see uh, this is the main reference for those. Um, and an example of the use of these kind of features is here's an image, here are some images which are part of this image, except they're taken from a slightly different camera viewpoint. So, for example, you may be able to see that this image here is, I think it's taken from here, or maybe there, not sure which. Um, this part here is the totem pole here, rotated 90 degrees, and so on. And if you use these as, as query images using this as uh, your input data, you end up getting some fairly good matches despite the big rotations and scaling uh, dilations. So, SIFT features are still used fairly widely in image processing. Okay, uh, on to the next section, which is pattern classification. Um, we wish to classify a novel input pattern according to the location in the feature space of a feature vector extracted from it. And just to go back to this slide again, we, up until now I've talked about the kind of features that are extracted by this stage here. Now we want to talk about how you do the classification at this stage here. Um, decision boundaries are locations in the feature space where the classification that we're going to assign changes. So in that example here, you might find a, uh, a decision boundary separating the green pluses from the blue crosses somewhere like here. Okay. Um, there are, let me just go back to that, there we are. Um, decision boundaries should be located depending on statistical models of the input and the training data, which hopefully will be the same. 
uh, and performance criteria such as computational cost, including speed and memory, costs of different types of classification error. For example, classifying A as B may not be as bad as misclassifying B as A, depending on what A and B represent. So, um, there are a number of ways of approaching this problem. Um, I'm just going to go on one slide further. Um, here, is, here are some training data, these small a's and b's and c's in a two-dimensional feature space. Uh, one, the, the simplest, perhaps, way of classifying this novel input is to assign it to the class which has the nearest training example. So in this case, the nearest training example to this is, is this a here. So we'll, ass we'll assign, assign this input vector to class A. And then these training samples are known as exemplars in, in that case. Here's an example where we've, instead of looking at the individual training data, we've replaced that with a prototype for each of these three classes. So this big A here is at the center of gravity, roughly, of these four A's here. This, this B is kind of at the centroid of these B's, and this C is at the centroid of these C's. And we could say then, well, which of these centroids is closest to our input vector? In this case, it's going to be B. Finally, we could draw lines, definition boundaries, which separate these classes. There's the, this line here separates A from the others and this line here separates B and C. And in this case we could classify the input as class C because it's in this region here. So you can see that with the same training data and the same input we get three different results. Um, so it can make a difference how you do this. Um, exemplars is, is the simplest um, and we assign the input to the class of the nearest neighbor. It could be the single nearest neighbor or we will cover a thing called the K nearest neighbor classifier uh, where you take a majority vote uh, among the nearest training examples. Prototypes where we're classifying the input against some parameters of a discriminative model of the training data or definition boundaries where we're classifying the input against some probably parametric data model. Okay. Um, the best that you can do with a classifier is the so-called minimum error or Bayes classifier. Um, and the way of achieving the, what you can show to be the minimum error is to assign your input feature vector x, which is a d-dimensional vector, to one of these C classes, omega i, so omega 1 to omega C. Um, and to do that, we define a set of these so-called discriminant functions, one, one of these things for each class, which depend on the, where the input vector lands in the feature space. And we assign the input vector x to the class omega m, m for maximum, for which the discriminant function is maximum. So for which the discriminant function for that class is bigger than the discriminant function for any other class at the location x in the feature space. And if that's true, then we'll assign x to the class omega m. Uh, you can show quite easily that this minimizes the average error over the whole data set. Um, and a natural, a natural choice of these discriminant functions is to use this thing, which is the posterior probability that a given value of x here came from class, the ith class. Um, is everyone familiar with this notation for posterior or conditional probabilities? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so this is read 
as the probability of omega i given x. Um, so, and it's known as the posterior probability that the given value of x uh, came from the ith class, omega i. Um, so you can show that this rule, this so-called Bayes decision rule, where we say that if, if this class has a higher posterior probability for the given input vector x than any other, then we'll assign the input vector to that class. And this minimizes the average error rate, as you can show thus. Uh, and the, the minimum rate is known as the Bayes rate, p star, which appears here. And it's less than you can achieve by any other um, classification scheme. However, there are other choices of these discriminant functions that can achieve the same uh, minimum error. Um, if you are familiar with posterior probabilities and prior probabilities and conditional probabilities, you will know this thing. This is called Bayes' rule, and it expresses the posterior probability of this class given the data in terms of the so-called likelihood which is the same thing the other way around, the probability of this data given this class. And P of omega i here is the so-called prior probability that a given data comes from the i class. And this here is the marginal probability of the data, it's datum x itself. So, P of x here doesn't depend on any of the classes. So you can, instead of using this posterior probability as your discriminating, discriminative function, you can use the top of this fraction here. And you'll still get the classes ordering. The, the ordering will still be the same. So if we set our discriminant function to this product of likelihood and prior, that's these, this product up here, for each class, then this will produce the same ranking of the classes for each, for a given input. And therefore, it's going to be maximum for the same class, uh, as setting it to the posterior probability, as we did in the, the last slide. Um, another substitution that you can make without affecting the results is to take the log of this thing, because the log is a monotonic transformation. The order, if you take the log of both sides, you, you get the same ordering. So we can choose the discriminant function for the ith class to be the log of this thing. Uh, log of a product is a sum of logs. So this, would, this is more convenient. It makes the prior probability of each class here explicit as well. So this is very commonly used. Here's an example. Um, here are some, the, the, this is a likelihood of cl class omega 1 multiplied by a prior probability of class omega 1, which is the probability that any particular datum comes from it. Prior probability or likelihood of x given that it comes from class omega 2 times the probability of class omega 2 is this peak here. Projected onto this bottom plane here, they look, there's, there's an ellipse, that's this thing projected onto the bottom. This thing projected onto the bottom appears here. And here's a decision boundary that gives you the best separation uh, and the minimum error classification. Okay, uh, decision regions, so-called other regions between these decision boundaries. So if our input vector falls anywhere in this R1 here, we're going to assign that vector to class 1. If, it, if, it, if the input vector falls anywhere in class, uh, in region 2 here, 
which curiously appears over here as well, then we're going to assign the input vector to region 2. And the reason why this region continues over here is because of the relative imbalance in the prior probabilities of these two uh, classes. Okay. Uh, here, here's a brief example. I won't go into all the, um, the detail here, but just to show you some examples of how this works for normal or Gaussian variables. So here again is our likelihood or log, log likelihood plus the log of the prior probability of class, the ith class. Um, this is a Gaussian distribution or normal distribution. Um, are you familiar with normal distributions, Gaussian distributions? Yeah. Yeah, some people at least are. Yep, good, okay. So, um, so this is a Gaussian distribution. Um, it has a mean mu i. It has a covariance matrix sigma i, which expresses the shape of the distribution about the mean mu i, which is in, in the middle. Um, this is just a normalizing factor, so that the area under the whole distribution is one. And this quadratic product in here, we take a, negate it and take the exponential, and that's a, a Gaussian shape. Uh, so if you take the discriminant function as the log of this thing plus log of the um, prior probability of the ith class, this gives you this thing here. This quadratic product here comes from here. You take the log so you get rid of the exponential here. Uh, this normalizing constant appears here. This is the same for every class i, so you can neglect that. The covariance matrix appears here, and the prior probability of each class appears here. So, um, how does that work in, in practice? If you have, the first of all case, uh, first of all, I'd like to look at the case where all these classes have the same distribution but different means. So different means but they're otherwise identically distributed, so sh same shape of distribution with different centers. Uh, and the distributions are spherical or circular in two dimensions. Then the uh, covariance matrix is diagonal. You can ignore terms independent of the class and get a very simple uh, discriminative function, which is this. It's simply a, a quadratic a parabola, effectively, plus the log of the uh, prior probability of each class. So this thing is, is just a parabolic, um, a hill, if you like, centered at the mean of the ith class. And this prior probability of each class just shifts these functions up and down. So if the prior probabilities that these things are equal, then these discriminant functions are equal at points that are halfway between the class means. Uh, we don't really need to worry about this, but effectively these, it means that these things can be discriminated optimally by a, a, a simple linear discriminant. So a line in two dimensions or a plane in three dimensions or hyperplane. Okay, uh, so that's fairly simple. This is a one dimension, uh, sorry, D minus one dimensional hyperplane and it's perpendicular to, this is a vector that joins to two class means uh, and passes through this point here, which is the midpoint, but it can be shifted away from the more likely uh, class mean. We'll show you the, in, in pictures what that means. Here's a, a one-dimensional case. Probability of, or likelihood of class omega one, likelihood of class two, looks like that, uh, except 
the prior probabilities, how likely each of these classes is, is they're not equal. Uh, this class is, that's 0 0.7, this is 0 0.3. So this class is more likely to occur in the data than this class. But otherwise, the distributions look the same. Um, and in this case, the optimal discriminant is this value here. Um, in the case where the, this class is way more likely than this class, the optimal discriminant has moved over to the right where it's, it's even further to the right than the maximum of, of the likelihood of the other class. Okay. In, uh, here's a two-dimensional example. Class one, class two, projected onto this plane at the bottom. Here's class one, here's class two. These are circularly symmetric Gaussians. Here's region one and region two for the case where this is 0.8 and this is 0.2. So this class is more likely to occur than this class, which shifts the decision boundary over from the midpoint over to the, this way. Over here, we have a situation where the prior probability of this class is 0.99 and the prior probability of this one is only 0.01. In that case, the decision boundary has shifted way over beyond the peak of the less likely class. Here's the same thing in even higher dimensions. Here's a three-dimensional version representing these two kind of, th these are supposed to be three-dimensional Gaussians, which is kind of difficult to represent on a two-dimensional page. But as the prior probability of this class becomes less and less, the decision boundary, which is still a hyperplane, moves over to the right further. Okay. Um, you can look at how these things change with slightly different types of distributions. I won't bother getting into all that. Uh, you can go through this if you particularly want to know what these uh, things look like. Suffice to say, in the cases where the classes have equal distributions but they're not spherical, then the decision boundary is still a hyperplane, that's if the classes are Gaussian, um, but it's not it's no longer perpendicular to the, uh, the line between the two class means. So here's class one, here's class two. These are, these are elliptical rather than spherical now, and the decision boundary is, is not down here. It's now slanted like that. Uh, make this class less probable, and again, it moves toward and beyond the less probable class. Here's another example. These look kind of spherical, but they're supposed to be elliptical. Didn't show up very well on this, on this page. OK, uh, for arbitrary normal distributions where the covariance matrix is different for, for each class as well as the mean, then uh, we, so the discriminant functions become differently shaped quadratics for each class. Um, I've, relative to the copy of the slides that you've got, differently shaped is, is not there. I put that in last night when I realized that uh, that was a, a, that's an error there. Um, they're all quadratics even in the case where the uh, distributions are the same. Uh, but in this case, they're differently shaped. Uh, and these decision boundaries then become things called hyperquadrics, which look, for example, like this or like these. So you can get some pretty wacky shapes. Okay, so that's enough about classifying normal distributions. Uh, nearest neighbor classifiers um, are probably the most common type of classifier that you'll come across. Um, and the idea of a nearest neighbor classifier is that we classify a novel input feature vector by the class of the nearest training vector. We have a set, a big set ideally of training vectors 
such as these red and black uh, examples, and they're labeled, so we, kn we know that this is an example of the red class, and this is an example of the black class, and we simply assign an input vector to whichever class the nearest training vector to it comes from. So these are the decision regions, uh, and they form a so-called Voronoi tessellation of the feature space here, where these decision boundaries uh, are halfway between each pair of training uh, examples. So with enough training data, these decision boundaries can get very complex. Uh, and you can have as many classes as you like. And in principle, there's no need to model the class distributions like we just did with all these, these Gaussians, where we were effectively using the distributions to determine uh, the classifier. We don't have to do that. We can just base it on the data. Um, and we can, the problem is we may not be able to do as well. Uh, if we have unlimited training data, you, it can be shown that the average error rate is less than double the best rate. So it's, it's not the best achievable, but it's less than double the best achievable rate. Uh, so that's good, but in order to achieve that, we need to have enough training data to adequately represent uh, the input data and to cover this d-dimensional input space. There's a thing called the curse of dimensionality, which you may have heard of, which essentially means that as the dimensionality of the space increases, you need exponentially more and more and more data to represent uh, the behavior of the distribution. Uh, computation and memory requirements for this classifier. Remember, what we're trying to do is for a given input vector, we want to compute the distance to every training vector and then and find the smallest distance so that we can assign the input vector to that class. That involves, so if our space is d-dimensional and we have n training vectors, here they are. So for each input vector, we need to compute n distances or squared distances and then find the smallest one. So that involves in the case, this is the case for a single training vector xi here. This involves d subtractions and multiplications to compute its, the square distance between it and this training vector. And then we need to repeat that n times because we need to, in principle, we need to find the square distance uh, to every training vector. So we can take this minimum and find the closest one. Therefore, the, the amount of computation here increases with the product d times n, which can be potentially rather large. Um, other approaches to this, one is to try and get round the fact that this can be rather noisy if you just take the nearest training sample. Excuse me. One way of doing this is to, instead of taking just the one single nearest training vector, you can find the nearest however many training vectors, the nearest k training vectors, and take a majority vote among them. And this may do better than a single nearest neighbor, simple nearest neighbor classifier, particularly if the classes overlap. So here's a case, for example, it's kind of difficult to see which is the red and which is the black, but here are the nearest five training vectors to this input vector, and three of them are black and two of them are red. So here k is five, and we're going to assign our novel input vector x 
to the black class because they're in the majority of, of these five training vectors. Despite the increased computation here, this reduces the effect of outliers or noise effectively in the training set. Um, another consequence is that the average error rate can further approach the Bayes rate provided that we have a lot of training data and take a, a majority vote among enough samples. In practice this is a trade-off as these things usually are between computation and accuracy. Um, this is how it looks where uh, up here is the error rate, along here is the minimum error rate, the Bayes rate. Here is the upper bound which is twice the Bayes rate. For a simple nearest neighbor classifier just looking at the, just assigning the input vector to the single nearest training sample. That's this curve here. This is what the error looks like. Um, and as you increase the number of training data and the number of samples that you take the majority vote among and have this ratio 10 to 0, you can show that the, the error progresses down here like this. And it will arbitrarily closely approach the uh, Bayes rate in the case of unlimited training data. So, uh, whether you can do that well depends on the, the priors and how separable the, the data is. Okay. So, how can you go about trying to reduce the amount of computation in a classifier like this? There are three main, way, main ways of doing it. One is, you only need to do part of the distance computation. Um, so, for example, here, this is from the previous slide, the square distance between our input vector x and uh, the training sample xi here is this thing, sum of squares of the differences of all its components. Um, if we've already computed the square distance between the training sample and several other uh, I'm sorry, between the input sample and several other training samples, as soon as this sum here gets bigger than the, the smallest one, we don't need to do any further computation. We can reject that sample. So you only need to use, uh, you can abort when the partial sum exceeds the current minimum. You can also use um, a subspace and do an initial distance check on a um, less than the whole space. Another thing you can do is pre-index the training samples and use a partitioned version of, a version of the feature space or the training data. So for example, with this input here, we could say, well, since it falls in this area of the feature space, we'll just compute the distances to training samples within that sector and we'll just ignore all the others uh, to save computation. Uh, if you do that, of course, sometimes you're going to lose your bet, as in this case where the actual nearest neighbor was this one. But this, does, this can nevertheless be used. Uh, you might try different partitions of the data, not just one. Um, so, only, only use a k-dimensional tree or only compute distances to training samples in the same partition. Uh, another thing you can do is edit the data set. Get rid of training samples that don't contribute. So, you could remove samples surrounded by neighbors of the same class because they have no effect. Uh, you could also remove samples near the boundary which are considered to be likely to be noise. Um, here's an example of a thing called Wilson editing by th this guy Wilson in 1972. Um, the idea of this is if you have um, 
samples which are of a different class from most of their k nearest neighbors, you can remove those from the data set and then just use a single nearest neighbor classifier instead. So here's an example for k equals 7. For example, this training vector here, the majority of its neighbors, of its seven neighbors, are of the other class. So we can remove that one. There it is, that's, that's the, the removed sample there. Same with this one here. The majority of its neighbors, these guys around here, are of the other class. So we can remove that from the data set. Uh, there it is there, gone. Uh, and just use a simple one-dimensional, uh, one single nearest neighbor classifier. Here's another example, more complicated, where this nasty looking boundary here after simplification looks something like that. Just from having removed a few of these samples near the boundary there. Okay, uh, we'll keep going a little longer uh, and then we'll bail out. Um, there's a problem called overfitting with any kind of classifier and there's, uh, the issue of generalization comes up. Um, we usually partition training data into training and test sets. So you train your system with the training data and then test it with the test data. Uh, the problem with that is that any system performs better on the data that it was trained on than on the test data that it hasn't seen. Um, and that ha that's true even if both of these sets of data are sampled from the same probability distribution. And this problem is called overfitting because the system learns the training data rather than the distribution, which is what you would like it to learn. So this affects all systems trained on data at all. It's generally worse, however, if there's less training data, because it's, it's easier to overfit to less data. If there's noise in the training data, you fit to the noise rather than the distribution of the data. The more parameters you try to learn from the data, the, the more complex your classifier. For example, the more parameters in parametric or the more complex your decision boundary in non-parametric classifiers. Uh, here's an example of that where we're going to try and fit this polynomial. So it's an mth order polynomial. There are m plus one parameters and we're going to try and fit it to n data points. Here they are. If we fit this polynomial to these data points, we get this squared error, average squared error, data point minus the value of the polynomial. So here's, here's the underlying function that we're trying to get at. The data that we're given are from a noisy version of this green sine wave here. But we don't know the sine wave, we just know the noisy data, which is the sine wave plus some Gaussian noise here. So we're given these blue circles and the idea is to try to uh, fit our polynomial to these circles. Okay, so here's a zeroth order polynomial, which is just a constant, and that is the best fit to these blue circles. Not very good. Okay, now we have a first order polynomial, that's to say a line, and we're going to fit a line to these data points with a minimum squared error. Looks like that. Still not very good. Now this is a, a cubic polynomial fitted to these data points. It's starting to look better. It's starting to look more like this, the true sine wave here. So you might think that the more we increase the order of the polynomial, the better this fit gets. Uh, which is true in a sense. So this is a ninth order polynomial now and it exactly fits all the data points. Magic. Um, should we be happy? Probably not because it actually looks nothing like 
the distribution, the underlying distribution of the noisy data that we were trying to learn or to model. Uh, so we've exactly fitted the polynomial to the training data and the error on the training data is exactly zero but there's not much to be happy about because we have overfitted the function and we've overfitted it to the noise in the data rather than learning the underlying distribution of the data. So that the approximation is likely to be very poor for any new data if we go back here and we get some more samples like these blue circles, this line, this poly, red polynomial is not likely to be very near to any of them. Um, this is what the error looks like as, as you increase the order of the polynomial. When we get up to here, the, uh, the training error suddenly drops to zero because we've got enough points or enough order in the polynomial to fit all the data. But the data on a new test set jumps uh, and it, the, the way that's phrased is that overfitted solutions have poor generalization so when new data arrives it's unlikely that we're going to do very well with an overfitted solution. Back to the salmon versus sea bass example, uh, you will remember that this linear boundary did a not too bad job discriminating these two classes. Here's an overfitted boundary which exactly fits the data but it's unlikely to generalize well to new data. Okay. So ways of reducing overfitting are first of all you need to choose a model that is complex enough to represent regularities, that's to say the probability distribution of the data, but not more complex. Because if you try and make the model too complex, you, you end up overfitting. Uh, this is an example of general philosophical principle known as Occam's razor. Essentially, uh, explanations or hypotheses should be as complex as necessary, but no more complex. Um, we usually use a, a tool called cross-validation to try to address this problem where you partition the available data into several sets, use most of them for training and one, the one remaining one for testing and then change it. Use, for example, tenfold cross-validation, split your training data into ten sets of roughly equal size use nine of them to train your system and one of them to test it. Then use a different one for testing and the other nine for training. Then use another different one for testing and the other nine for training and so on. And average the test error over all the, these partitions. Um, in the extreme case, if there are k data points, this is known as leave one out cross-validation. Normally 10 is, is quite commonly used for this. Uh, okay, uh, I think we'll leave it at this point because um, this is a slight change of subject, differences between detection and verification and recognition, um, which we'll, we'll get onto this next time before we get onto the machine learning. Right, that's it for today then. Does anyone have any questions or anything you didn't understand or both? Yeah. Uh, yes, P of omega i is the proportion of that class in the uh, total training set. Let's see. Uh, we're talking here. You, know, you you mean this this P of omega i? Uh, yes, um, you could estimate this probability as the proportion of samples from class I in, in the total training data, yeah. Uh, if you had an infinite amount of training data, 
then, yeah, this would be the proportion of data from, uh, from class I in the, in, the, in the training set. Other thing is, can you hear, when I turn around and look at the screen here, can you still hear me at the back? Yeah? Okay. Any other questions or comments or anything? I'll just make just add one comment about the uh, stuff like the um, these examples of the Gaussian um, discriminant functions and and so on. You you're not going to have to know about this stuff for the example classes. I'm, I'm pretty sure <laughs> uh, it's unlikely that uh, I, I just put this in for completeness and so that you can get a feel for how the decision boundaries move depending on the shape of the classes. You're not, you, you don't need to know all this stuff. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. I've seen another version of the cross validation for calculus. Slightly different. Okay. So what it says is when it just takes the training sample into two parts, namely training sample validation sets and the test sets. And we use training sets and the validation sets to choose the hyperparameter and we use test sets to evaluate the performance of that system, or the of that model. What's right. the difference between the two versions? Uh, not much difference. I, I would say you've got, you, the one you're talking about is you have a, a validation set separate from training set and separate again from test set. And you use the validation set, you train the system with the training data and then test it with the test Right. And then choose the best hyperparameter. Okay, uh, so you're still, uh, at that point, you're, you're still learning the, teaching the, the model, still learning the, the data model. So you're learning the data model from the training set and from the validation set as, as well. You're lear learning higher level parameters of the model from the validation set. Right. Uh, we don't know which uh, which order is the performance best in this case. If we use yeah. validation set, we can choose the hyperparameter that performs the best in the validation set. Right. And it, and uh, finally, we evaluate the model. Yeah. Test the okay. So that would be not unlike uh, in this case. Um, choosing the order of the polynomial on the basis of the validation set and then doing the training on the basis of the training set. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, there are, uh, let's see now, well cross-validation is the main 
I would say the main um, way that it's done, but re really it comes down to um, knowledge of, of prediction of what the data is going to look like um, and how, how you should go about modeling the data. So domain knowledge, I think, is, is quite important. Um, for example, the, um, with the example of the, Gauss, the Gaussian uh, assumptions and the um, having discriminant functions in, in, a, uh, in a feature space there, if your data isn't Gaussian, but you assume that it is Gaussian, um, you, you may end up having problems. Um, I guess in the, with over, overfitting is, it can't be avoided totally because any, any system that's trained on training data, even if you're trying to teach it uh, model parameters for, for Gaussians, um, there will be some bias um, due to the, the fact that you have a finite sample from the, the distribution. So using more data is, <laughs> as well as cross-validation, having, having more of the stuff is, is probably the number one uh, approach, I think. Um, you will often see um, papers where people have estimated parameters on the basis of data which really isn't enough. Um, election polls where um, the, the number of people who've been asked about their intent, voting intentions uh, is so small that the margin of error is quite large. Um, and if you, ask, if you ask a different group of the same number of people, you, you might get quite a different result. Uh, having, having enough data, I think, is the main, uh, as well as the cross-validation is uh, key. Uh, any other questions? If you think of any, you can always ask them next week. Right then. If you're happy, I'm happy. Okay, right, thank you very much for coming and see you again next week then. Same time, same place. <laughs>